Good morning, Mesa. Good morning. The scripture for this morning will be coming from Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 8 through 12. It's Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when he, to, when he was called to go to the place he would re later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. He lived in tents as Isaac did and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, who architect and builder was God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she was considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sand on the shore. Thank you, Elijah. Well, you've had your rainy day, so that's it. It'll come around next year again sometime, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was nice sleeping, and uh, now it's gone. Or maybe we get a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, lots of good things going on, like we've already said, and just Bible Bowls coming up. I know it this works the same way every time. You know, people say, well, yeah, I'll sign up if they need me. And then we always wait till the last minute, and then Brad gets even less hair because uh, he's pulling it out. And uh, so then he says, oh, we got to have 40 more houses, and then everybody signs up, and it all works out. Let him keep some hair, okay? <laughs> Just go ahead and sign up at the Welcome Center because that's going to be one of those things. We need to house like 60 or 70 kids. So, yes, your house is needed. Uh, and if you can take 30 teenagers, that would be great. <laughs> if you want less than 30, you might put down the real number that you would like. So that would be good. There's also family talk cards that are at the Welcome Center. And so if you want to go get one of those, those are um, a way to discuss what goes on today. And so it might be on the sermon, it might be on the songs, or it might be on some of the things that are happening. But uh, just pick up one of those. It'll help you in leading a discussion with your family. And so we're just trying to provide that as a way for people to not just end it here, but to take that on with you. And so go to the Welcome Center, you'll find one of those as well. So today we want to talk about inheritance. I don't know if you're getting a large pile of cash from some long distant relative. Uh, maybe you're expecting that and you're excited about it. It's probably a rich uncle somewhere. Your parents know you too well, they're not leaving you anything. So, it's got to be somebody that's more distant that uh, doesn't quite know you as well. And so, a lot of times we think about that and we think we're going to collect things and leave it for our kids. And then we think, why would I do that? <laughs> Maybe I'll just spend it now. But inheritance is an important part of Christian concept and what we're trying to do. And so, the passage that's been read to us in Hebrews 11 talks about Abraham, and it talks about the inheritance that Abraham was to receive. Except for this is a different kind of inheritance. Now, Abraham grew up in Ur. That's where he was raised. That's where his family was. That's where all the ties were. That's where the businesses were. That's where everything was that uh, would be a financial gain for him. And God says to Abram, I want you to leave, and I want you to go to a place where I'll show you. And it says he doesn't know where he's going to. Now, you realize what this means for inheritance. He's leaving one inheritance behind in order to get another inheritance. Because everything else is back there. He's got to leave all the family inheritance. He's got to leave the family business. Now, he can take the, the flocks, the goats, and, and the sheep and everything with him, but uh, any ties from past family that have been there, any houses, any land, any development that his father had owned and his grandfather and people like that, he's got to give all that up. He's not going to get that inheritance. 
And I think that's one of the most important things we have to recognize is that in order to get the inheritance of God, we have to leave behind the inheritance that we wanted, that we thought of. And so I think as you look at this passage and you look at what's really going on, he has a lot of wealth, but he's leaving all of that behind. Ur is perhaps the, the center of the world at that time. It's Babylon, it's Mesopotamia, it's where that fertile crescent is, it's where everything is centered, and he leaves all of that in order to go to a whole other land and not own a single thing. He gets no land inheritance except for what God is going to give him. And when you realize what he's doing here, he leaves his home, he leaves his land, he leaves his country, he leaves all of his relatives behind because he is looking for the land of God. He's looking for his inheritance. He's looking for that new city. And so he leaves the past inheritance. And maybe that helps us with the possessions that we have and we think about our inheritance. I have all of these great things that we have that we're going to be able to pass on and that we have that we've been able to save up and able to get. And we usually think of that as our inheritance. But God says, I'm your inheritance. And that's what's really what inheritance is really all about. Paul talks about the, the things he had gained as a Pharisee and how he had this great reputation and prestige. And he says, I've counted it all as nothing but garbage that I might gain Christ. There's a new inheritance that I'm trying to get to. And it's much better than the other one. Uh, as Stephen is talking about Abraham when he's giving his defense in Acts chapter 7, it, he says, and he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Well, that takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? I'll give you all of this land. You will inherit, but you're not going to own any of it. Well, that seems backwards, doesn't it? Don't we have to own it first in order to give it as an inheritance? And I think that trips us up a lot of times because that's what we begin to believe is that, well, I've got to own it first and whatever I can get and I can gain, then I can give as an inheritance. And God's saying just the opposite here. He's saying, if you'll get me as the inheritance, if you'll take me and take the promises that I'm going to give you, I will give you all of those things. I will give your children all of this land and it will all be yours. And that's what he does when he gets to that promised land is he shows him all of those things. He says, look as far as you can see, every single bit of land that you've traveled through, every single bit here will belong in your family. But you don't own a single thing. And the way you give it to them is by giving up your past inheritance in order to come for the inheritance that is there now. So what if we could pass on an inheritance that we don't own? Wouldn't that be better? Because think about how much you've got saved up. Do you really want to save it for your kids? I know, I already hear laughing going on. But what if we could give them more? What if we could give them something that is so much greater because we're going to give them the promise of God and, and what God's going to give them is this huge blessing. And so I think as American Christians, we have a problem with sharing. Uh, we want to own it. We want to control it. Maybe you can see this. Guess who's inheriting the money? <laughs> yeah, there's only one person dancing there. Uh, but that's more our idea of things. We live in a gated community because we want to protect ourselves. We want to protect all the stuff we have, and so we insure it. Uh, we want to protect our stuff. We don't want people messing in our stuff. This is mine. We have passwords. We have locks. We have all kinds of things that ensures to keep everybody else out because this is my stuff. This is my little, my, my little stash, my little pile. And I want to insure it so that it, if it crashes or burns, I still get it back because that's all I've got. And then Nancy and I ask our kids, well, what is it that you would like to have? In their silence on the end of the phone, they go, we don't want anything you've got. 
And we were shocked. It's like, what? I mean, we don't have a lot, but they said, no, we don't want anything you've got. We think you ought to get rid of it now so we don't have to. <laughs> Nancy and I looked at each other and said, we've got to go buy more stuff so the kids will want it. <laughs> no, we decided against that. We're not doing that. So, but that's what happens. We save our treasure for so that we can give it to them and they don't want our treasure they think our treasure is junk and, and so don't try and save what you have amassed for them because they're not going to appreciate it they're not going to want it it's not something that's going to be there for them don't give them something that's old and doesn't work but what about faith as an inheritance can you give them that same principle if your faith is old and doesn't work, don't try and give it to them. They're not going to appreciate it. They're not going to want it. So let me encourage you to keep your faith fresh so that there's always praise in your mouth, so that there's always prayer in your thoughts, so that this is something that's a great relationship that you have with God that you're able to share with them. Because otherwise, if it's just, well, yeah, I go to this church and I sit there. And if that's all you're giving to them, they may not want it. And they may not think that's a great inheritance to have. But if you have a great faith and they're able to see how God has blessed you, they're going to want that kind of blessing for their life as well. So keep your faith fresh. We tend to think of grace as being free, and so therefore it must be cheap. But if you really think about it, freedom is one of the most expensive things you can ever have. It costs Jesus his life. It costs lives every day to be able to keep freedom. There's a tremendous high price to keep freedom. So I looked through scriptures and tried to determine what uh, inheritance there is that we are able to find in scripture. And so let me share that with you. These are things that we hear at according to scripture, according to my ESV version of scripture. And maybe yours has a couple more. So the first one is we inherit the earth. And it talks about the meek inherit the earth in Matthew 5. We tend to want to inherit by war. You know, let's fight, let's sue somebody, let's inherit the earth by what we can gain, by how much we can take over, by what we can control. Jesus says it works just the opposite. The humble or the meek person is the one who will inherit the earth. The next one is we inherit eternal life. We don't inherit it by selfishly trying to get ahead, not by all the toys we amass, not by all the things that we gain. We inherit eternal life. And it's talking about a quality of life there, not a length of life. Because The rich young ruler comes, he says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? I've got all of this wealth. And he says, get rid of it. Well, that goes against everything. This is my inheritance. And he says, then you'll keep that inheritance and you'll forfeit mine. What do you get to get eternal life? We do not get it by keeping our selfish attitude and by trying to amass a fortune. We inherit the kingdom of God. We don't inherit it by politics. It is not by the political things that we can do, whether it's in the church or in the government or wherever it is. We inherit the kingdom of God because we are children of God. And that's what it talks about as an inheritance, is the kingdom of God. We inherit salvation. We don't inherit it by our own victory. The passage in Hebrews 1.14 talks about angels coming to protect us those who inherit salvation. So we do have the protection of God, not by our own strength and not by our own might. And then we inherit promises. We inherit good promises because God actually takes care and does all of his promises. It's not like some of the promises that we might get from other people or some of the contracts that we might get, even though it is signed on the bottom and dated and has a stamp and a seal there's sometimes when those contracts don't go, don't, uh, they don't pan out. And you don't really get what you thought you were going to get. God delivers on his promises 100% of the time. Every single bit of the time. And so when you look at what we inherit, 
because of Scripture, because of God, well, there's all kinds of things that we're able to inherit. We inherit the earth, eternal life, the kingdom of God, salvation, the promises of God, and the promises of God gave this huge land mass to all of Abraham's family. And when you see that and realize that, it's not by the normal way that we would go about it. But that's what he's trying to say, is you give up those things in order to inherit by the right way. Okay, so what are the requirements for inheritance? It's very simple. Number one, you're part of a family. Number two, there is a specific plan or rules or guidelines. And number three, there must be a death before you inherit. And so if you're not part of the family, you're probably not in the will. There is a will. It explains exactly what's going to happen, exactly who gets what, and you have to abide by the things of the will. And then there must be the death of the person who's giving those things. And so it's really pretty simple. That's what it takes. All you have to do is just be part of the family and do the things that, that make up that family. And so I want to share with you a verse today that, from Ephesians chapter 1 that talks about what this inheritance looks like. And so taking not just the overview where the kingdom of God, where you have salvation and things like that, but bringing it down to what does a person actually get when they inherit. And so Ephesians 1 is maybe one of the best places I know that talks about a lot of these blessings that we're able to have. And so, he starts off, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him and were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And so I know that's a lot of words, but to break it up, it's, it's going to seem disjointed. And so I wanted to get all of that in. I hope that really speaks to you because he says so many good things, and that is such a powerful passage. And yet sometimes we get lost in it because it tends to run on. I think he says you're part of a family. And here's how you get to be part of a family. He says, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. We've been chosen before the foundation of the world. We are holy. We are blameless. We are adopted as sons. We have redemption. We have forgiveness of sin. We are according to his grace. And so he says, all of those things make you part of family. It says, you're chosen, you're adopted, you've been blessed, you're holy, and that's who we are. That's what it makes of us. And so he draws all of those things together and says, this is some of the blessings of just being part of family. And it's easy to say family, but when you say, you know, you're holy, you're blessed, you're chosen, you're forgiven, you're redeemed, all of those things really give a different quality to it, don't they? And so this is part of what you inherit is this kind of, of grace from God, this kind of direction that we're able to have. And then he talks about we are according to his purpose, his will. We are to the praise of his glory. He makes known the mystery of his will and the purpose in Christ. It's the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things on earth and heaven. 
And so we are predestined to the purpose of his will that we might be to the praise of his glory. All the way through here, he talks about the plan, the plan, the plan. Here's the purpose. Here's the thing we're doing. And so all of this is about this great purpose of God because he wants all of this to happen. And certainly he doesn't give you a list of, okay, here's the rules. You have to do all of this. But he's saying there is a plan that God has in mind and he's been carrying this plan out and we are part of this plan. This is the way in which it all works. In Christ you share in this inheritance. In Christ you've been adopted. In Christ you're an heir. In Christ you're, you're in this family. You're part of all of this. And what a great thing it is to realize that you know, this started before the foundation of the world that he had all of this planned is to make you part of a family that, you know, the truth is, not many of us are Jewish. We wouldn't really fit in Abraham's family. But somehow we get adopted in. And so that's what he says, you're able to be adopted. Otherwise, we would have no chance at inheritance at all. But he says, because of Jesus Christ, we are able to have that inheritance. And that's the thing you see at the very end of this. Because we have heard of the gospel of our salvation and have believed it. Well, the gospel is the good news about Jesus. And it's specifically about his, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so it does take the death of Jesus on a cross before there's any gospel. And so it is about the death of Jesus. And about this inheritance that we're to receive. And then he says, you're going to be sealed with the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. Well, the time we're sealed with the Holy Spirit is the time when we die to ourself and we're baptized into Christ. And so there's the other death that needs to occur in order for this whole inheritance to take place. And because of that death that Christ gave and because of our death to ourself, we're now given that Holy Spirit. We're now sealed. God says, you're my kid. Do you ever want to put a stamp on your kid and say, you're my kid? No, we don't want to do that. People would notice. But he does. He trusts us that much and says, I want to put my spirit in you so that you will be able to do this. And it comes out of our death and out of that burial and baptism, and that's where it all starts. And so I think this is huge when you think about what these three things really are. You're part of a family, there's a specific plan, and there has to be a death. So in this adoption into a family, we're leaving the old family and we're coming to the family of God. Abraham believes in God, and he builds the crib, and he leaves Ur. And some of you have had to leave some of your family because they didn't like it when you became a Christian. They didn't want you to do that. And you realize that the family I have in God is much better, much bigger than my old family. And the inheritance I'm going to have in God is much better and much bigger than my old family. And what a joy it is to be able to have your physical family and this heavenly family as both the same thing. And so when parents are able to raise their kids in, in Christ and have them grow up with this blessing, what a joy it is for both sides to be able to say, we have this blessing together. This is your real inheritance because that's what's most important. And it comes with this plan. It has conditions. There are rules. We live according to the plan, according to the condition of his will we, there's always rules in the house, isn't there? Clean up your mess. It's your mess. It's not my mess. You clean up yours, and then I'll get you to clean up mine. <laughs> but there are rules to the house. I mean, that's what you have to do, right? There were rules for Abraham. You have to go live in a new land. You're not going to get an inheritance if you just stay here. You have to have a child of promise, and I'll give you that child of promise, and then I'm going to ask you to sacrifice that child of promise. Wow. That's pretty hard. But that's exactly what Abraham does. And because he is willing to follow the rules of what God said, 
that you would not withhold even your only son, we are able to inherit such a blessing. He says, because you're acting out what Jesus is doing. I'm not going to withhold Jesus either, except for there's no one to take his place. He's the one that actually does die for us. He is the sacrifice for our sin. And he is the one that makes us whole and clean and new again. And it always comes with a death. You see, none of that will be fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime, so he will need to die. And Jesus would need to die on a cross in order for Abraham's people to inherit anything. We only get that one inheritance. And it's a death to self. It's a death that we have when we become part with Christ. And we choose Jesus instead of all the world stuff we could have. Too much storage, too much insurance. Jesus doesn't have that. You're able to have such a huge blessing in him. And ours is a death to self and to the inheritance of the world. Because that's where it really comes to. I saw this. The best inheritance a parent can give to his children is a few minutes of their time each day. They're probably not going to remember all the stuff you want to give them. Mine have already let me know. You don't have anything we want. So I hope maybe time was the best. Because that's what I hear over and over again. I would give it all away if I had ten more minutes with them. And it's just that amount of time to be able to say what you do with your child. I was talking with Joel about this whole lesson because we kind of collaborate on some of these as he's preaching. And he's going, but how do I get this across? How do, what is it that we're asking people to do with this? And I said, well, how do you train Truett? And at the time, I can hear Truett in the background chasing ducks. For some reason, he's going, no! No, <laughs> I don't know why he doesn't want ducks to do whatever ducks are doing. But I said, well, how are you doing through it? You know, how do you parent? Is there a list of rules we can get for how to parent? No, he's out walking by the lake with his son, chasing ducks. And it's just the time of what you do as you live out those blessings each and every day that they get it. They see it. They understand it. They know what you stand for because you've been there to do those things. It isn't that you amassed it and then handed it to them. You handed them inheritance a little bit every single day. And that's huge with what God's able to have. It's huge with what families are able to be. And it's so incredible when we see all of this happen. And I realize that sometimes it doesn't go well. Sometimes some people are not part of a family. I've even known some adoptions where the adoption didn't go well. I mean, it was good at first. All the paperwork got filled out. But somehow the child never became part of the family. Didn't feel like they belonged, didn't fit, didn't want to be there. And it just was a horrible situation. And you can see that sometimes where people don't join in the family. They don't want to be part of it. And they, they rebel against everything. And so they never adopt the character and nature of the family and how they interact and the things that they do with each other. And they don't follow the family rules. They don't want to do the things that the family does. And so they're always rebellion and making their own rules. And they never accept the family traditions or how things are done. And so... There's no death. There's only selfishness. I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want. It's pretty hard to give any kind of inheritance to a person like that. And they get what they want at the expense of other people. You insist on your own rights in my own way. It's not about sacrificing for the good of the family. It's all about me. There's not much inheritance there that they're ever going to get. And I see it happen in church. Sometimes they do the same thing with that. I'm not going to follow the rules. I don't want to know what you guys think. I don't care about you. I just want to have my own way. And it's my own selfishness. And 
They don't come, they don't visit, they don't sit, they don't get to know anyone. I don't want to belong here. I just wanted to sit in a pew and go home and go to heaven. I'm sorry, but I think you've missed the point. I think inheritance is all about being part of the family and about belonging in that family, and that's the way God passes it on. That's the blessing that he's able to give. And if we think we can do it by not being involved in the family, we've kind of missed the whole idea of inheritance, haven't we? And so we're part of the body of Christ. Each one of us is part of this family. We've been adopted and we embrace this family of God and we find brothers and sisters in this deep spiritual relationship that we're able to have with so many people. And we do follow what the Bible says. We follow his word. We follow Jesus' teachings. Not just church rules, okay? You may rebel against church rules, but we're going to follow what the Bible says. And that's what brings so many people here because that's what we try to do here. We don't try and make up church rules. We try and follow exactly what the teachings of Jesus are. We follow exactly what he wants of us. And being part of the church means a death to ourself. It means Jesus died on a cross for us, but it also means that we take up our cross and follow him. We surrender and we repent of our sins and we die to ourselves, and we're buried in baptism and we're raised to walk a new life in this new family that we have with new relationships and new blessing and we accept the new family that it brings and it brings us so much joy. It's a new way of living, a new way of life and then the next step is, well, we have this inheritance, let's pass it on. And so we want to pass it on to more and more people. And that's really the way in which it goes is we share all of these things as part of the spiritual family of God. And so let me just ask you today, do you feel like you're part of the family? If you're not, well, you need to be. That's why we're here. We want to accept you in. We want to adopt you. And God says you're chosen, you're special, and you choose to come here. And we want you. Isn't that great when your family actually wants you? I mean, that doesn't always happen, you realize. There's always a few weirdos, and so we'll accept some of those too, right? But we want you to be here with part of us. And if that means your, your death to yourself and your baptism into Christ, then let's do that today. If that just means your repentance and straightening out your life and saying, I want to be part of this family, I invite you to come while we stand and sing.